All right, we're back for episode two of The Mortgage Show. Can you believe it's been a month since our last episode? I I can't. Um, and I was like really, really geeked up with like, the response to the first one. So it's, yeah. I, I'm, I'm happy with it. How about you? Yeah, definitely. I shared it with a bunch of people. It's been kind of a different thing, I think, that we're doing versus other people. We're just getting out mortgage information, real estate information in a conversational way, something people can digest when they're in their cars. People that we do business with can kind of chip away at over an afternoon or a morning. And uh, I'm glad to be doing it for episode two, man. So you want, want to just dive into things? Yeah, let's dive into things. And I think I think what's pretty cool, and maybe you noticed this too, is when we did send it out, mm -hmm. I'm a big podcast guy. I know you are. Yep. Um, I always just assume everybody does podcasts, but it's it's pretty cool to see a lot of people are actually listening to podcasts now because it's yeah. like it has taken a little while to kind of catch on, I think, in our area, if that makes any sense. It does. And it's funny that some people, when I send it to them, they're like, oh, yeah, I don't do Spotify or Apple podcasts. And that's why we post it on YouTube, too. <laughs> so there's a few different ways that people can tackle Spotify and Apple are podcast specific apps. Obviously, YouTube's more of a video thing where you can put podcasts on and people will consume it as a video. But between those three, people should be able to access it if they want to. So, yeah. So, so let's dive in. Big day today. Federal Reserve made some announcements today. Tell me about it. Yeah. So it seems like we're in an area where they're not too concerned with inflation anymore. So mm -hmm. I, I was thinking about this prior to hopping on. It's like inflation has been sort of the the elephant in the room for us. It's It's been the sole reason why rates have kind of spiked and climbed obnoxiously the last few years and kind of t did some crazy things for us. Mm -hmm. I mean, watching watching the interest rates the last few years has been, it's been pretty interesting and it's been inflation related. So now that we've got tame inflation, the Fed is not as hawkish on it anymore. And they're actually starting to worry, okay, is the Fed rate too high now? Mm -hmm. So, yep. and I guess, I guess the issue with that is, is that, you know, you, you raise the rate to stop or, or sort of curtail the heat of the economy. Yeah. Um, slow down inflation. Slow down inflation in short. And now we're on the other side of it. Inflation seems to be tame. And it's like, all right, are these rates too high? Is it really mm -hmm. starting to stifle the economy? And, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on where I feel like we're at the ground floor of a really interesting area as far as the economy. Which way is it going to tip? Is the Fed yeah. going to react correctly? It seems like they reacted properly to raise it. Now, are they seeing this where they need to reverse and go the other way? And they're, they mentioned possibly three reductions to prime. So yeah. what does that mean for us? Yeah. Um, so they're in this situation where they have to walk this tightrope where you know, they have to try to create this soft landing of not rising rates too high. To, so it completely tanks the economy, but just tanking it enough to tame inflation, but then start backing off so we can continue some more limited growth. So just for a little bit more context, I think the CPI reading came out earlier this week and it was 3.1% annualized inflation rate, which is good. Lowest has been in a long time. So that yep. kind of leads us to today where they pause on raising rates. And I don't think they rose rates last time either, but the news is like how many times they're gonna anticipate cutting it next year. Um, so that all leads us into this situation now where we've had a really favorable three or four weeks for interest rates, which is nice. Yeah. Obviously it stinks for people that might've closed a month or two ago, but it seems like their opportunity to refinance will be here before you know it. But rates have come down to, you know, we were up into the mid eights, certain situations, certain credit scores. Now we're, you know, down to the low sevens or sixes if you're in certain type of products. So it's nice to be talking about those numbers again. It really is. And I think one of the things that, you know, as I was driving home, I'm thinking about, all right, what are we going to talk about? And one of the things that's a concern, so it's like everybody still notices high pricing for mm -hmm. every good that we're buying right now. It's so funny how I feel like it's manufacturing's re quote unquote refi boom right now for them where the profitability is like, I mean, they're taking advantage of it right now. Every price that you see on goods should not be as high as it is right now. It should yeah. be coming down and they're just enjoying the profit margin as they can. And until really the spending power of the consumer starts to stagnate, which I think it, it is now, it's going to finally start putting some downward pressure on goods. But mm -hmm. ultimately, this is the area where organically the cost of interest rates starts coming down to help with that. So it, we're, we're in a good spot, and especially in our industry where it's been a little weird for us the last couple of years. Definitely. Yeah, so I'm 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 pumped. You mentioned it. People bought houses with high interest rates. It's going to be fun 
refinancing them the next couple of years. Yeah, they bought those homes and they accepted those high payments that came along with those homes. It'll be nice to knock a percent or two off their interest rate, save some people 500 bucks, 600 bucks a month, which will make a big difference in their own personal finances, I'm sure. So that's stuff that we're always monitoring for people, obviously. So we'll be sure to reach out to people um, as the rates come down. But it is nice to kind of see we're at the top of that roller coaster and things are starting to come down a little bit. And so, I, I think it's important for us to mention it would just be foolish of us not to keep a database of these interest rates and not reach out to these past purchases to mm -hmm. refinance them. So it's like everybody listening to this, just know Randy and I take it pretty serious where it's like, we've got this database. We know that we want to help them. So that's a huge part of our business. 100%. So we'll keep monitoring that. So that's good news. Did you want to share the candlestick chart? Real yeah, let's quick, do it. Give people that are watching a quick visual, then we'll kind of move on to a few other things because we have another guest coming up shortly. Yeah, let's do it. So if you are watching this, the major thing that I like to show on this report or on, on this chart is you can see the 39 BP. This number being green is always a great thing. Um, the 10 year treasury, which is, I mean, you could look at any website to find this treasury figure. When that figure is red, I mean, this is a really good day for us in the mortgage industry and real estate agents, blah, blah, blah. It's like this, this actually is just showing us that you know, if you if you climb over here and you see this really large green candle, green is good, guys. Green up mm -hmm. the chart is a really good thing. When the trading heads up the chart, that means interest rates are going down. This, how it's denoted on this website is the 39 basis points, green, good thing. 18, red, also a good thing with the mm -hmm. treasury. And you could just see, guys, today, that uh, today's business day going backwards every business day. You could you could see we're climbing up the chart right now. Interest yeah. rates. They want to push lower. And that, that's what Randy and I followed that sort of gives us or tips us off that interest rates are trying to lower. Yeah. So we want to change the narrative. It's not all interest rates are bad, bad, bad all the time. Like they're starting yeah. to get good. So when you guys are talking around the holidays, you know, I mentioned, you know, I heard rates are getting better and, and better days are ahead on that front. So we'll keep beating that drum over the hopefully the months to come. Hey, do you like that? I, I think it's such an amazing thing to have so many people concerned about the cost of financing. It's, mm -hmm. it's really neat to be in a room and, and be the person that actually gets to talk about this stuff. Do you enjoy it? I enjoy oh, it. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, people talk to me about it all the time. I can't get away from it. So nice. But up until now or the past couple of months, it's it's always been a very depressing conversation. Yeah. I mean, can you believe how high rates are and the cost of homes? And now it's just it's <laughs> a little bit nicer to be like, hey, rates are moving in the right direction. You know, this is this is getting good. We're gonna start saving some money here. So I think it'll be a little bit of a different tune this holiday season. Yep. Agreed. So, all right. So moving on from rates, want to talk quick product stuff. But I want to talk about some of the more unique, it's called non-QM mortgages. And we really have two variations of them. We use a company called Home Express. And this is the lender that we would use, again, for just like stuff that doesn't quite fit in that conventional FHA, rural development, VA box that we use for most borrowers. Or do you want to just jump into the two use cases for these type of loans? Yeah, I'll jump in a little bit. I, th I just think it's neat where it's like, we have the Fannie Freddie product that everybody offers and it's like our bread and butter, but our, our dual licensing as a company allows us to go into this non-QM area, which is basically mm -hmm. the type of mortgage that doesn't fit inside of Fannie and Freddie. 20% down is basically where you start. You have to have a mm -hmm. mid FICO score of 620 for, for mm -hmm. most of these options. And I guess, you know, I look at it, Randy, where if it makes sense and you have mm -hmm. the down payment, this product is there for the self-employed borrowers. Yeah. So let's, let's focus on that one because yeah. there's, there's an investor version and then there's a person that's going to occupy the house version. And the first one is let's focus on that self-employed borrower. This is probably ideal for the self-employed borrower that doesn't show a lot of income on their tax returns. As most self-employed borrowers that we've worked with over the years, they just try to minimize their tax liability as much as possible, but it's to the detriment of their ability to qualify for a mortgage of very yeah. low income. But if they have good down payment and a good credit score, we could look to do this non-QM. Again, QM stands for qualified mortgage. These type of mortgages will allow us to come up with an income stream based off of deposits into their bank statement, as opposed to what that bottom line number is on that tax returns. So those self-employed people that keep things really skinny on their tax returns probably have large deposits into their bank statement that we can show as revenue and use that. And that would allow them to get into a home. So that's something more and more people have had interest with in the past year, as again, people try to minimize their tax liability. So that's number one. And I think what's neat about it is, is it's like, it actually makes sense. 
Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's like common sense lending instead of this yeah. in the box Fannie Freddie guideline that we've been dealing with with people that write off their income. Mm-hmm. So it's it's nice to actually have something to offer them that actually makes sense. Mm-hmm. How many times have we run into a self employed borrower that's like, I could give you my bank statements, mm-hmm. like you could see everything that goes into my account, and it's mm-hmm. and I always want to say yeah. That makes sense, but what yeah. are you showing your tax returns? Now we have something, which is really nice. But it's important for realtors to know that this profile, this borrower profile, is not that first time home buyer, that person that just started their, their new business. It's an established self employed borrower, again, with good credit and a good down payment. It's not 3% down, it's not 680 credit. It's got to be a little bit better than that. So I think a lot of times people reach out to us thinking that we can be creative in quotation marks. Some of the first time home buyers, this isn't a way to be creative. This is again, probably for like those better borrowers that the biggest issue is the income that they show out on their tax return because they're self-employed. So that's the number one program. The next one is for investors. And this is a DSCR loan. People may have heard that acronym before. It's a debt service coverage ratio loan, where if you're going to buy an investment property, it really comes down to the numbers of that property in terms of rent versus the payment on this loan. Again, it's going to be for good credit people, big down payment. It doesn't take into account the rest of that person's personal finances. It really is just off the building. But the best part about it, and I'll let you talk about it here, is that you can actually use short-term rental income, which isn't the case with most conforming loans. Yeah, our conforming loan options, again, that's the reference to Fannie and Freddie. It's your typical lease scenario. If you're looking at the tax returns for the reported lease income um the option on this is really great because it's like i always think randy about somebody that's buying a lakefront property to airbnb it it's like who doesn't want to do that if you could find the right lakefront and you're getting that weekly income that is just insane this product allows us to use a rent comp schedule based off of airbnb comps not Mm -hmm. your typical monthly rent if you had just a standard 12 month lease or six month lease Mm -hmm. with somebody. So this is really nice actually. Yeah, it's nice for those short term rentals for sure. So just know that we have these type of unique loan programs that can help again, the self-employed borrower that's looking to occupy good credit score, good down payment. And then we also have this other program for investors looking to do short term rentals where the numbers don't quite work because of the short term rental aspect using conventional financing. So wanted to share that with you guys. I think it's pretty cool. So keep that in mind. We're happy to chat about this stuff. We're happy to go to an office and do a sales meeting with someone or get a group of realtors together to kind of dig into a little bit more. Um, But it's great different types of loans out there that not everyone has access to. So going to move on to a couple more things before we bring our guest in. Had this thought about, well, now that borrowers are required to pay their school loans on a monthly basis, that it's hurting their ability to get a mortgage. And I've actually had the opposite experience. And again, I'll see what you think in a second where... They think, oh, now that these people are forced to make these payments, now they're not going to qualify for as much. And as I've been pulling credit, I actually see it quite the opposite because I don't know if people realize this, but this period of time where borrowers have had their school loans deferred, we've still had to account for those deferred school loans. And oftentimes we've had to assign a 1% of the balance payment on a monthly basis or half a percent of the balance on a monthly basis. So, for example, if you had $100,000 in deferred school loans, and it's 1% of that per month, that's a $1,000 per month payment, right? Or $500 per month payment. And the reality is now that people are actually making their payments again, we can just use what's on the credit report. And oftentimes what's on the credit report is a lot lower than that half a percent or 1%. And it's actually in their favor now that they're being forced to pay it. I'm sure they don't like the fact that they're paying it as opposed to it being deferred. But when it comes to qualifying for a mortgage, it's actually better. I don't know. Have you seen that? Yeah, I've seen it. And I think the thing to relay here is it's being accounted for, even though like the the feel part of it for the consumer, I mean, it sucks. They're going to have to repay finally. Um, mm-hmm. But we've actually been qualifying you guys for years now based on the fact that you're actually going to have to repay it at some point. Yeah. So we, we've we been considering it and, and I guess that's the mechanism so we don't allow you to overspend. So yeah, yeah. It, and to your point, Rand, I have noticed it, it runs so randomly where a lot of times you don't see a payment, so you're assigning that 1% or half percent. So the reference to that, guys, is Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have a different rule. One's half percent mm-hmm. and one's 1%. So the, the approval process between both software options or both agencies is so random. I don't know their mm-hmm. algorithm. Randy doesn't. Nobody does. The mm-hmm. smart people mm-hmm. in the room do. So it's it's something that we consider definitely when we're running mortgage options. Yeah. So. 
Yeah. Yeah. The important thing is, like you said, it's always been accounted for, even if the borrowers really haven't been accounting for it in their own personal finances. We've always had to assign something for it. And I don't think the fact that the people are having to pay now is affecting them negatively when it comes to to getting a mortgage. It's it's quite the opposite. Yep. So keep that in the back of your mind. Last thing I want to run through is just a little bit of a credit underwriting tip. We want to talk about stuff like this on a monthly basis, just share some news. People ask me occasionally if we can waive escrows. You get that question? Yeah. Uh, random. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you know, know how five percent of all loans, less than that. Like it's not a it's usually like an older person, I feel like maybe like a little bit more old school. They want to hold on to their money. You yeah, know? Randy, you just nailed that, man. Cause I, I'm <laughs> sitting over here smiling as you're unwrapping that. I get the I don't want them to make interest on my money. I would rather make interest on my own money yeah. conversation. I love that. So yeah. You but it's what? an interesting thought because what I'll tell you right now is that yes, you can waive your escrows, but there's a cost associated with it. Right. Yep. So couple things to outline and just comment where you want, but like you cannot waive your escrows if you're doing an FHA, VA, or USDA loan. Those are government loans. They're going to require you to pay your escrows. And the reason is paying your escrows means you're putting money on a monthly basis set aside for taxes and insurance. Those government programs want to make sure that a borrower is setting aside that money so there's no chance that they don't pay their taxes or they don't pay their insurance. It's all built into the escrow account. So they're not going to let you waive that. You can waive it on a conventional loan but you have to have at least 10% down on a purchase or at least 10% equity on a refinance. And I think that that's a little bit of a threshold for people that, you know, not everyone's going to cross that. Most first time home buyers have less money down, but if you do waive it, there is a 0.25% fee that you have to pay as part of your closing costs. 0.25% on a hundred thousand dollar loan is 250 bucks on a $400,000 loan. It's a thousand dollars and so on and so forth. You know, $800,000 loan, it's, it's $2,000. So it's like, I guess I would question like, is not having an escrow and paying $2,000 worth like interest, you know, like, are you going to make that money up in interest in for like the $8,000 in taxes or $10,000 in taxes? I don't know that you are, but there is this mental thing around it. And I would just want people to know that sure you can waive escrows if you want, but there's a cost that goes along with that. And whether or not the lender tells you that that cost exists, it does. They're either baking it into the rate and paying a higher rate for it, or they're charging you this 0.25% fee at closing. Chris, what are your thoughts? <laughs> Randy just dominated that. I don't really have anything else to say other than the fact that Randy maths really well. He does it very <laughs> effectively and you just dominated that. Uh, but seriously though, I guess really the, the reason why there's a little bit of risk in there is like we should explain if somebody doesn't pay their taxes, ultimately the town is going to throw a lien on the property, which is going to affect the title, which also mm -hmm. ultimately affects the marketability of the property, lien positions, all of that stuff. So at the end of the day, lending wants you to have an escrow. So they incentivize you. They yep. incentivize you by not having the fee or they disincentivize you by having the fee, however you want to look at it. But yes, you can waive tax escrows. No big deal. There is a small fee. One thing that cannot be waived is flood insurance. Although you can waive homeowner's insurance being escrowed with no fee. It's really the tax piece. That's the big thing for lenders. So um, common misconception in lending, but it's a, it's a thing that we have to field questions on once in a while. And we just want to get that out there in case anyone ever encounters it or has any thoughts on it. A little bit on flood insurance. When we were going over the notes, you sent that email. I'm like, you know what? We never talk about flood, what that process looks like. Just mention that real quick is that while we're going through the underwriting process, underwriting is pulling a flood cert, which is basically they're looking at the flood maps to make a determination if a property is in a flood zone. And then there's different determinations of risk if you are in a flood zone, which then kicks you into different areas of yearly amounts. Mm -hmm. And that's always an interesting process while you're going through the loan. Uh, underwriting. Most people are not thrilled to be notified that they're in a flood zone. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's always, it's always a fun thing. So I would say the majority of agents are actually listening to this podcast. It's like, I think it's actually a good part of the process for agents to kind of give a heads up to buyers, say, this might be in a flood zone, mm -hmm. you know, a heads up, there might be some flood insurance here. That's a, a cost thing that you're going to have to consider. Yeah. We typically don't find out until we're already submitting a loan application and then we have to do this flood cert check. And then the flood cert comes back and says it's in a, a flood zone and buyers finding out about it at that point when they're already under contract. And it's just a kind of a big mess, but um, not ideal when it happens, but it's part of the process and something that we need to pay attention to as lenders. Yep. So um, we get a guest beds. Should we bring her on? I think she's amazing. I think we should bring her on. And I think you guys should be excited to hear from her. Yeah. All right. Let's do it. We'll bring her on now.
All right, I want to welcome Darcy Bastarash. Darcy is the York branch manager of Norcom Mortgage. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Hey guys, thanks for having me. I'm pretty psyched to be here with you. Yeah, Darcy, good to see you. Thanks for coming on. <laughs> you're our second guest. So I think we want to have you on because we love you and we think you're awesome. But we wanted people to know that Norcom isn't just me and Chris in the Soco branch. Norcom is a company that's based out of Avon, Connecticut. There are other branches in the East Coast and Midwest and all over the place. So, and you operate that other branch. And although we're different branches on paper, mm -hmm. we're, I, we're all part of the same family. We're all trying to help each other out and want to promote you and all, all that you do. So tell me about your mortgage background. How long have you been in the business for? Yeah, sure. 24 years. And I wow. uh, started as a an assistant to four loan officers after I had uh, quit my job in chemistry, mm -hmm. much to my mother's dismay, you know, <laughs> but... Oh, well. so 24 years. So it's been quite a run for you. That's longer than you beds, right? Not by that much, but just a little bit. Uh, October was my 20th year. Yep. And Darcy, yeah. I mean, I'm sure you can attest to this. Like it has been so fast, so crazy. And it's, it's like a roller coaster. Yeah. And mm -hmm. Randy, how many years are you now? Are you 14? I think I'm 15. I think it was 2008, yeah. maybe end of 2008 that I got in the business. I kind of lose track of it, but that's what I tell people. Yeah. Wow. It's crazy how fast it goes. You know, they talk about kids growing up fast, right? And we all have those. But yeah. doing mortgages every single day, day in, day out, 24 years has seriously flown by. Like that. I reached out to someone last week that it was the 10th anniversary of when they bought their home. And I was like, wow, man, 2013. I mean, obviously I was in the business before that, but it was just like, I can't believe these people closed 10 years ago. You know, it's just wild. Huh. Yeah. I've done three loans for kids of clients. That's wow. scary. Yeah. yeah. You know what? That's um, a great compliment though, right? To be able to do loan for someone's kids after doing their parents. 100%. 100%. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I, yep. I had one actually mid last year where one of my first purchase loans, I remember it when the guy reached out to me, um, he's like, Hey, I'm referring my daughter. And it took me yeah. a second to sort of calibrate who I was talking to. And then I was like, my God, I remember when that kid was like four or five at that closing <laughs> and now she's Absolutely. coming to me for financing. So it's like, I'm in the middle area where maybe someday she's going to refer her kid. Totally. <laughs> Which, totally. We're still doing mortgage events. Yeah. I remember, you know, I love to go to closings and hold babies, right? Because my job is done at that point, right? We're at the closing, our job is done, and we just get to sit back and enjoy and watch the joy on people's faces and closing. And mm -hmm. what better way to do that by sitting in a closing and holding a baby? So, yeah. yeah That's sure. very cool. So one of the other reasons I want to have you on is I think the three of us are very focused on providing value to the Absolutely. people that we work with, you know, our referral partners. I mean, it just happens to be that realtors are the type of people that we work closely with, uh, you know, referring business to them, them referring business to, business to us. But I think the three of us want to be the type of people that we provide value to the people that we do business with. How important is that for you? Yeah, 100%. I go into this knowing that I want to help people achieve their long and short-term financial goals mm -hmm. through home ownership. Uh, and that includes making sure that they are part of a good team. And the way that we can make sure that they're a part of a good team is by working with Norcom throughout the state of Maine and other states as well, where we can add value to our referral partners and bring those referral partners as part of the team. There's nothing better than giving our referral partners a, you know, a referral ourselves rather than them yeah. sending us referrals, right? And the way that we're going to be able to get those is by having those repeat customers so that we can send them back to those referral mm -hmm. partners and provide tools for those referral partners to grow their businesses. So Absolutely. I think we have the same philosophy and that's why we work so well as a great team here mm -hmm. in Maine, both Sacro and York, and then the other states that we're licensed in. Yeah. So It's such a funny thing to talk about that idea of you know, being able to give a referral to the people that give so many referrals to us, it doesn't happen as often as I would like it to. Like, I, yeah. I wish that it happened at a 50-50 clip where it's like, we're referring realtors 50% of the time and they're referring us the other 50, but it really is still like, for whatever reason, people end up at realtors, whether it's through email or just calling their office or whatever, and then they typically get referred to us. And it's just the natural flow of things. Yeah. At some point, I hope it changes, but for now, 
it's just it is kind of the way it is. I equate it to homeowners insurance people for us, yeah. right? Like it's just homeowners insurance people are downstream for us. Right. I'm always going to give more referrals to homeowners insurance people than they're going to give to us. Absolutely. And they, they return the favor to me by doing a good job for my customers, getting them a good rate, good communication, all that, uh, and make me look good as someone that referred to them. So that's, I think that that's how we all feel we are trying to be to the realtors that refer us. Would you yeah, agree? Absolutely. So. Can I jump in real quick? So Darcy, since we've met, I've thought one thing when it comes to our relationship, and I think it was great when Randy's like, hey, let's have Darcy on the pod. And I think Randy's <laughs> ultimately alluding to the value that we could give our referral partners. But yeah. I can tell you that I think you are such an amazing teammate, even though we're not the same branch. I know that we're at the same company, but since the second that I met you, the, the way that you include us and get us involved in things, I've just been super thankful that we've gotten to know you and that you're on the same team as us, even though we act independently. So I can only imagine you are so amazing with your clients and it's not a surprise to me that you're doing well. So it's like, I want to thank you for being so great to Randy and I. So definitely. Well, thank you. That, that means a lot to me. I am all about team period, mm -hmm. regardless of there, there's few of us in this industry and there's a lot of business to go around. And the more that we can help each other out and make sure that the business continues to excel, uh, the better off we all are. So yeah. I agree. It is a small business. I feel like we know everyone, whether you're a Norcom person or a lender someplace else, like we all cross paths with each other in Maine, which we certainly did before you started at Norcom too. So it's now it's kind of funny. You never yeah. know how people shift around and end up working together at different points in their career. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So do you have any hopes for 2024? Like what, what are your hopes? What any, Anything special you got going on? Um, uh, you know, I think 2024 is going to be a big year in the mortgage industry. I think that we are potentially going to see the first of two refinance markets, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And I think that the key for all of us having been through the refinance market of 20, you know, 2020, 2021 is get back to basics make sure that you're taking care of your referral partners. And I mm -hmm. think that's why when you came to me a couple of weeks ago about making sure that we were doing some great things for our referral partners in terms of continuing education, social mm -hmm. media, whatever it might be for training, I think that is going to be key for 2024 because we're going to have to wear a couple of hats as loan officers. Yep. And my goal is to make it seamless for my referral partners, quite yep. honestly. Yep that they I'm getting that gravy from refinances and they don't even know it. So, yeah, totally. Yeah. And you mentioned providing CE opportunities for our realtors. And one of the things that we're looking to do is probably do two CE classes for our realtors next year, where we would cover the cost, get the location, bring in some people to teach those and have them to be able, be able to come and learn some good content, but also get credit for them as they're needing to do on a yearly basis. I yeah. think we're, we're targeting an April, October situation if I remember correctly, but we'll, we'll spread the word on that. But that is something that we're looking to do more of in 2024. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. Anything you want to finish up with beds? Um, Darcy, the, the, you were touching upon the refi market. And I think that there's two things that that looks like is number one, the last two years of purchase business being over 7% interest rates. You know, we're starting to see a lot of reports that are suggesting you know, fives in the five area interest rates. So that's going to help with, yeah. you know, bringing down some of those purchase rates. But also I know a lot of people are accumulating debt. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people right. have grabbed equity lines and those equity lines tied to prime have pretty, pretty high interest rates. So it's, it's going to open up that opportunity to do some debt consolidation also. So I'm, I'm with you next year should be a busier year for us. And it yeah. might be a little bit more rewarding because we're going to start seeing some people free up debt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, it, just to, to loop back around to us being a team, um, I teach here at Norcom, I teach the mortgage coach class mm -hmm. to our team at Norcom. And I think that the three of us are going to be able to get together, uh, Randy, Chris, and myself, get together and really hit that training hard so yep. that we're ready for those refis and yep. ready to help those borrowers 
who may need to consolidate some debt. And it's yeah. a perfect tool to yeah. really show how you can manage your debt with a mortgage. So. Well, listen, thank you for coming on. Thanks for everything that you do. Looking forward to a big 2024 with you uh, and all that lies ahead. So thanks again. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Have a great Thanks, day. Nice see you. All right, see ya. All right. How much do we love Darcy? That was great to have her on. Um, her positivity, it just, whenever she's around me, I'm just like, man, she's a really happy person. I love being around her. <laughs> totally. I'm glad that she could come on and talk for 10 minutes. So she's the best. I'll look forward to working more with her next year. Yeah, same um, here, man. But hey, you know what? That's it. Another half hour in the books. Another podcast episode done. Do want to take a second to, to point out and ask the appraiser event that we held this week. We had our very own Ellie Pascone, who was our first guest on the podcast last month, come up to talk to a few people about the appraisal process. That was an event that we threw up on Facebook. People RSVP'd. It was great. Appreciate everyone that came and hopefully it was some good information there. Any thoughts on that, Beds? Um, Ellie's the man. Um, it's, a, it's a really big asset to have Ellie. Um, the appraisal process to me is just a so much better experience from the loan officer perspective that, I mean, we still have, it's an arm's length process, but it's so mm -hmm. nice to be able to have a contact to talk to. So, yeah. yeah. Really lucky to have him to work with, but also to have him come up from Connecticut to do that for us yesterday. I mean, that's a three and a half hour drive. They're leaving at six in the morning to get up to do that, just to turn around and basically leave afterwards. So we appreciate their support back at home office, especially Ellie and our guy, Kyle. So that was good. Um, that's it, man. You know what I mean? I'm going to be a nice relaxing few weeks, the holidays and stuff, and then we'll be ready to roll in 2024. So guys, thank you for listening. I'm, I'm having fun with this, Randy. So we're mm -hmm. definitely going to keep going with it. Yeah, it's fun. Easy half hour. Hopefully it's uh, some information you enjoy. You learn something, share it with someone that you know that might benefit from listening to it. And let us know what we can do to help. You know, we're always happy to help you guys grow your business. We're happy to work with people that you refer over that need help. You know, we're here to provide as much value as we can. So thanks again, everyone. Have a happy holidays. Yeah, guys. Enjoy your uh, holiday.